Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Today, my guest is Andrew Tan. Andrew is Managing Director and Head of Asia Pacific Private Debt at Musinich. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Thomas. Andrew, private credit has become an important financial alternative to standard bank loans in recent years. Can you explain us why? Sure. The situation has its origins uh, post the GFC, so post-2008 financial crisis. Um, what happened was that regulators starting put, started putting um, a great amount of regulatory capital requirements on banks uh, through the Basel III Accord. And what you've seen is that you know, banks have started having to put aside more regulatory capital when lending to smaller middle market companies as compared to large corporates. And so what this means is that, is that it brings down the effective um, return by having to set aside more capital when lending to these smaller companies. Sometimes, you know, when banks are lending to smaller companies, they end up having to put almost two times the amount of capital that they're lending out. This has basically caused banks to pull back from lending to middle market companies. And that's why, you know, there's been a surge of non-bank lenders actually coming in and becoming, you know, essentially substitute lenders uh, in that regard to especially these middle market type companies because the banks have been retreating. Hi there, just a two second break. Before we continue with the video, just make sure to subscribe to our channel now to not miss out any updates. Thank you very much and enjoy the video now. So given the current turmoil in commodity markets, inflation being back, um, interest rate rising, how does private credit fare in this current environment? It's a great question. Private credit, I would say, is actually um, a great asset class to be in in this environment because most of our deals are floating rate in nature, so typically a benchmark class margin. So in a, in a rate-wise environment situation, you, know, you are insulated from the increase in interest rates affecting, say, for example, if you were invested in a bond instead, you know, that's a fixed rate instrument, you will end up having your return eroded. Whereas in private debt, you know, typically um, invest in the form of loans. This is a benchmark plus instrument. So, you know, your return actually increases as the benchmark actually moves up, right? So that's one, one advantage of private debt. The second advantage I would say is that most of our structures and deals are senior secured in nature, are heavily covenanted. And, and basically protect you on the downside. So heading into an environment where there's a lot of talk of potentially a recession coming, you know, what we seek to do with our deals is to draw a, a very robust credit flaw on when we're putting together our transactions from the fundamentals of the company. You know, we look at the company's performance, historical performance, what the future performance could look like, and we sensitize you know, for a downside situation, and we provide the amount of debt that the company will be able to support even in a downside environment, right? So in that regard, with the structures that are put in place, um, with the over collateralization of our transactions, with the, with the covenants that are in place and the right sizing of these debt transactions, you, uh, investors are actually very well protected, you know, in a situation where there is rates rising, higher inflationary environment, potential, potentially a, a recession as compared to, you know, unsecured debt that may not have all these protections in place. Private credit is a relatively new as an investment topic, especially in Asia. Um, to what extent is private credit changing the corporate credit market in Asia? I wouldn't say that private credit is a new, new or is a new asset class in Asia. Actually, Asia Pacific has had private credit in some shape or form since the Asian financial crisis, 1997 Asian financial crisis. But what you saw private credit back to um, 2008, a lot of it was actually distressed debt, special situations type private credit, right? Not so much the direct lending that you see uh, perhaps today, right? It was only really in the last five to six years, you know, post 2008 with the onslaught of bank regulation with Basel III, where, where you're starting to see a lot more performing credit situations through direct lending, you know, where that is more yield, good, more regular yield driven situations, um, providing you with, with a stable income, in, income from the investments that's, you know, become a little bit um, more prevalent, right? So pre-2008, a lot more special sits distress. Post-2008, especially in the last five, six years, 
the market has changed, right? Market is changing with a lot more direct lending situations coming online. So that's how things have evolved. So I wouldn't say that private credit as an asset class is new in Asia. It's just that private credit on the direct lending side is, is in the last five years uh, grown in leaps and bounds and developed in a large way, really because of you know, what's been happening in the bank market. And that's beneficial to investors because where in Asia Pacific, previously, when you look at distress special situations transactions, you would have to wait you know, perhaps five years you know, before you saw a return on your investment because you know, typically in distress and special sits, you, you wouldn't have a fixed income type return instrument on a, on a quarterly or, or semi-annual basis. Now, you know, we are in a situation where we can lend to credit-worthy companies on day one and investors can, in the first quarter or first half a year, enjoy a uh, cash interest return. So they don't have to go through a very steep J curve like they would have had in the past with Asian private credit situations. So that's the step change, I would say, that's taken place in the last couple of years. So what are the most important themes, sectors, industries, and borrowers for private credit? And uh, yeah, where do you invest? And where do you see potential? So for us, we, we focus on you know, the more, I would say, slightly more developed markets in Asia Pacific. Um, so Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, India, China to some extent as well. But typically, if we look at China, it's more focused on offshore China type situations where companies have, I would say, a lot more of their business presence, customer base, you know, predominantly outside of China or hard assets outside of China. Right? So those are the, those are the way, that's the way in which we look at Asia. In terms of sectorial themes, you know, we are sector agnostic, but, we, but as long as they, they don't contravene our ESG criteria, you know, we don't invest in thermoco, we don't invest in in gambling, in vices, in tobacco, alcohol, firearms, you know, those sectors are off limits for us. But everything else is, is basically okay for us. We are sector agnostic. And where we are seeing a lot more action of late is really, you know, in technology, technology manufacturing, healthcare, agrichemicals, property, you know, uh, to some extent as well. We're seeing you know, pharmaceuticals, consulting services you know, in type businesses as well. So a mix back between some asset heavy businesses and asset like businesses, I would say. In terms of themes that we are seeing in the market right now, you know, there are a lot of technology businesses that in the last, I want to say three to five years have been spoiled, right? They have been given um, at lofty valuations, private equity money, cheap private equity money, basically, right? And, and a lot of times um, these companies think, well, of the mindset that, oh, we're going to be able to have access to this cheap capital going forward or this hot money going forward. But things have suddenly changed, right? In the last, I want to say six, six months, you know, there's, there's quantitative tightening. There, there is a pull up. There is a retracement of capital in, in, in the market. People are tightening their purse strings. So what happens is that there's, you know, a, there's a revaluation, re potentially a revaluation down in a lot of these businesses if they were to raise um, private equity money. So it's essentially a down round, right? So what they come to us and say is, hey, Andrew, you know, can you guys look at lending us private debt, right? To either, you know, um, bolster the, the, the capital structure of the business, take out, you know, potentially existing private equity investors who, who perhaps are coming, in, coming to, you know, a juncture in their fund where they need to get out or, you know, just to help continue to grow the business without having a down round done. So for us, we can look at businesses that you know are EBITDA positive. They have um, free cash flow. You know those are the ones that we can potentially do something for. But if those technology businesses have been focused at, on revenue growth at all costs without any profitability, then those are the ones that are a little bit more difficult, or challenging for us to help. Right. So we we do get a thematic from there in the tech sector. Um, another thematic that we see we are seeing is you know in situations where. Uh, it previously, some of these potentially larger mid-market companies, uh, they were able to raise public um, capital, either in the equity markets or public equity markets or public bond markets. But then, you know, with these markets essentially shut um, at the moment or, you know, faced with volatility, there's a bit of, there's quite a bit of uncertainty in whether or not they can actually get a public deal away, you know, private capital, uh, private market, private debt is essentially coming into vogue because um, you know they get certainty of execution you know and some of these guys are willing to pay that illiquidity premium 
could be two, three points above where they would have priced in the public market. You know, so we are entertaining those discussions as well. And, and you know, we, we, are, we are getting some of those deals um, done as well. So I would say these are some of the thematics and it's a good time to be a private debt investor with, with dry powder. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the, the typical loan size and the longevity? Yeah, sure. So we focus on the lower to mid, mid market players. So typical loan sizes for us are anywhere from, um, I would say, 15 million to 50 million US dollars equivalent in terms of size, right? This is different from, I would say, a lot of the, the big private credit players who focus you know, on 100, 50, 100 to 150 million ticket sizes and above, you know, where they want to deploy into, into really large size situations. That market is actually a little bit more crowded, I would say. And there's, some bank comp there's a lot more bank competition there. Whereas for us, you know, in the space that we play in, the, the banks uh, typically you know, are faced with regulatory capital constraints. So um, they don't, they are not, they don't lend as efficiently and the larger players, there's less competition because the larger players don't, don't focus on, on uh, this space, right? So in terms of duration, then the typical tenor for us is anywhere between, I would say two to five years, but most of our transactions are around the three year kind of mark with some amortizations um, built in. Uh, this contrasts with what you typically see in Europe and US, which, which is, you know, usually seven year deals. Uh, five to seven year deals, longer data, typically bullet with no amortizations. And the reason why in Asia you can actually get these shorter data transactions is because the growth rates tend to be higher in Asia. The, the capex cycles tend to be shorter as a consequence. And so, you know, timing to break even on projects is, is, is a little bit quicker. And so that's why we can start amortizing our deals much sooner because the, typical, the average, I would say, capex cycle is about a year and a half for companies, right? In terms of when they start spending the money to when they actually start reaping the returns on their capex spend. Um, so as a consequence, you have deals where after the first one and a half years, you can start basically amortizing your structures and, and that, that brings down the weighted average uh, life of the transaction. So those are you know, advantages for us because I think we can, we can make the money, recycle the capital or return capital to, to um, investors quicker. What kind of investors are currently investing in private credit in Asia and um, in, your, in your fund strategy as well? It's a mixed bag of investors. They're the more traditional institutional investors, insurance companies, pension funds, sometimes even banks uh, who are investing in the strategy. And at the same time, they are also family offices who have um, shown a keen interest and have invested in, in these strategies in size. Um, because I think They've come to the realization, especially with the more mature family offices that perhaps, you know, are not chasing outsized returns from the equity markets. They, they want something that is essentially more, that gives them a, a good amount of um, cash, ca stable cash interest return on an annual basis, either quarterly or semi-annually, you know, to the tune of 6 to 8% cash interest, but at the same time, be able to enjoy some, some upside from uh, from the investment, you know, towards the back end of the investment at the end of the two to three years or four years um, when, the, when the loan matures. So we typically have equity kickers in, in our transactions. So there is a fixed income component that returns anywhere from um, 6 to, to 12% cash interest. And then there is a, there is a uh, equity kicker, you know, component um, to share in the upside of the business that then yields, you know, brings us to say a, a 12 to 14% return. IRR return, right? So guys who basically want that cash interest, a nice cash interest, but at the same time be able to enjoy some upside, you know, um, at the end of the fund period, you know, that that's where it becomes very attractive for, for some of these more established, I think, uh, family offices, right? So that has certainly attracted a lot of money from, from them as well, as well as even, you know, individual ultra high net worth individuals who, who are interested in, in getting a stable return with downside protection and some upside um, sharing ability as well. So this was Andrew Tan, Head of Asia Pacific Private Debt at Mirzenich. Andrew, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your insights. You're most welcome. Thank you, Thomas. Appreciate it.